Um, good morning. Thank you so much for having me. So great to be here. I've been loving watching Creative Mornings um, online, so it feels very uh, humbling to be here speaking with you guys. Um, so today the theme is Pioneer. Uh, and when I started to think about the word Pioneer, uh, for some reason the vision that came into my head was horses galloping through the land, traversing new grounds, uh, breaking frontiers, crossing boundaries and discovery and all those sorts of things. And for some reason, I thought of John Dunbar from Dances with Wolves. I don't know if anyone remembers Kevin Costner. It was a big movie in our family. Um, but I thought it was really weird and I was like, why am I thinking about Kevin Costner when I think of Pioneer? And then I saw this wonderful illustration um, here, which I don't know if anyone's seen the movie, but there's bison all over the plains. Anyway, um, but for many, pioneering is about courage, uh, dreaming big, or breaking rules. But for my sister and I, um, in starting business, it was really not so much about breaking rules, but not, there not being any rules, because we didn't really know what the rules were. It was really about starting from nothing. It meant starting a fashion label, even though I had absolutely no experience in fashion. It meant following our hearts into business, even though we had no experience in the entrepreneurial world. It meant bootstrapping, being early adopters. It meant using our intuition because we had no knowledge in these areas. It was finding a new way of reaching the consumer because when you're such a small brand, it feels like you have no voice, especially before Instagram. Um, it really meant starting from a place of no rules, which really meant mm, drawing our own roadmap. So, I guess um, I want to show you where we started and a little bit about where we are now. Uh, this is me at the markets. Uh, Isabella and I started our brand uh, by hand making jewellery and once a month we'd head to the Byron Markets with our little 4x4 pop up tent and our hand painted sign and our little plastic Tupperware containers full of jewellery and we'd hope to hell we'd make enough money to buy some more materials and make some more necklaces. And um, I found a little video that I wanted to just show you a clip from just because it shows you, I guess it just shows you how homemade our brand was in those early days and uh, just a little glimpse of, of where we started. Going right back to the very beginning, like I, my ex-boyfriend Dad gave me a whole little box of really ugly, crappy beads <laughs> that he wasn't using, and um, I just started playing around with them. I was 23 or something, so about 10 years ago. Just kept going and going and making my own little tags and selling them in shops in Melbourne. Came up to buyer and just made it, made everything out of my wardrobe, my walk-in wardrobe in my house. We yeah, just had this little wardrobe. Yeah, it got really hot in summer. <laughs> <laughs> With this massive air conditioning unit you know, just pointing into, <laughs> yeah. into your cupboard. Finally got a little studio out in the industrial estate in Byron. And that was a little sort of shoebox upstairs um, in this big warehouse. That's when Lizzie came on board. She was just by one roll of toilet paper <laughs> at a time. Because, like, it was so tough and, you know, it must have been such a challenge. Oh, it was, yeah. I mean, it wasn't even really, yeah, I probably wasn't really making money. It was just money came in and money went out. And I was selling a jewellery for probably less than I should have been. And just because I loved it, I wanted people to have it. So, I guess uh, from this really humble beginning, literally making one necklace at a time, when I think about the brand now, um, it's really crazy to think that it's now a multi-million dollar fashion and lifestyle brand. We have a team of about 50 men and women, probably a few more women, but we do have some men working with us, uh, working with us up in our dream space of Byron, in Byron Bay. We have grown into other categories like apparel, swim, kids, homewares and bride and manufacture out of China, India and Peru. We have over 120 stockists around the world and a very loyal and passionate customer base. Last year, we won the Australian Telstra Business of the Year Award, which really cemented our place in the Australian business community. And today, I guess I wanted to share with you how my sister and I turned our little grassroots market stall into the internationally recognised brand that it is today. Um, also, I'd like to finish off today by just sharing another journey that we've started upon recently, which is, um, I guess, uh, 
we're pioneering a new path for ourselves in the area of sustainability and fashion. And in an industry that has, uh, ecologically speaking, a lot to answer for, um, it's a really important journey to us. So I just wanted to, I haven't spoken about it publicly yet, but I just thought I'd use this opportunity to share where we are on that journey. Um, so my sister, Isabella, is the designer and creative director, and I'm the CBO, or the chief brand officer. Uh, I didn't really know what that role, I didn't really, hadn't really heard of that role before until recently when I heard that Sarah Michelle Geller was the CBO of her brand that she founded. I was very interested in what that meant, so I looked it up and realised that it was very close to the role that I'd been playing for years. Um, but basically, I'm responsible for the brand's image, experience and promise. And I guess my role is really to ensure that the brand is infused with um, the right essence across the whole b business, from finance, marketing, customer service and everything in between. But nine years ago, if you looked at my CV, when I was starting the business, my CV pretty much just said film editor, because that's all I'd done for the last since I left school. Which really brings me to my story and how I came to be living up in Byron Bay running a fashion label with my sister. Oh, that's what I'm gonna talk about, okay. So this is me. Um, I was the ideas girl. Uh, that's what my mum called me. I loved it when she called me that because I was, I was her idea, ideas girl. Uh, my sisters were the creatives. Uh, my third, I've got three sisters, so two of them were the creatives and one of them was the science and maths girl and I was the ideas girl. But the only problem with being an ideas girl is I had no idea what that equated to after leaving school and I felt very lost. I started a uni degree and then dropped it and ended up finding a job as a film editor which was great and I sort of loved it. It took me from Melbourne where I was living to uh, London and then Sydney and I sort of was, you know, freelancing in Sydney and it was kind of all good but there was something missing. I was yearning for something else. I looked around me and saw all these people in careers that um, they felt, they looked all, they looked passionate about what they did. Like when they bounced out of bed, they sort of rushed off to their wonderful callings and I was like, oh, editing, it just didn't bring up any joy in me. And over the years, that sort of longing for something that I was passionate about grew and grew and really started to become a bit of a thorn in my side. Um, I remember, as Nicole said, meeting with her at Gertrude and Alice and spending hours and hours trying to workshop things that I was passionate about that I could turn into a career. But one of the only things I was passionate about was Native American vintage turquoise jewellery. This really <laughs> sort of niche market that was really difficult to sort of brainstorm a way to turn it into a career. So um, I remember going and hanging out at Four Winds Gallery, which is a little store down in Double Bay, and they sold all this sort of jewellery. And I used to just hang out there. And I think they used to think I was sort of casing the joint or something because I'd just hang out there. Because when I was around this jewellery, I'd get these like goosebumps on my, on my arms and I'd, I'd call it my turquoise feeling. And it was kind of like a compass. I knew when I was going in the right direction if I was getting that feeling. And editing was not giving me that feeling. So I think I would have gone along like this for quite some time had something not come along to shake me up. And it did come along. It came in the form of a huge breakup. They always say, be careful what you wish for. <laughs> Um, I was dating an actor at the time and he just uh, made it quite big on the Australian television scene and I remember at the time when we broke up um, I'd look out my bedroom window in the sunroom and I see the 389 bus go down O'Brien Street and his face was on the side of the bus and it was this really shit time every time it would go father <laughs> we're all good now it's fine but um <laughs> uh so it was a pretty dark time for me. I kind of spiralled down over the next year. I got quite depressed and went on antidepressants and went into therapy and my friends started getting pretty concerned for me. And then something really special happened. All of my friends in Sydney put money into an account for me um, that allowed me to do this self-development course that I'd been wanting to do but hadn't been able to afford it. That's me in Sydney in my sunroom painting, trying to find, trying to tap into my creativity. Yeah, searching. <laughs> um, so anyway, all of my girlfriends um, put money into this account for me to do this course. And I did the course, it was a weekend course, and uh, I don't even remember anything I learnt on that course, and the course doesn't even exist anymore. Um, but the day after the course, when I was doing my Bondi to Bronte walk, I remember just, it's like a light had been switched on just for a moment, and I knew exactly where I needed to go. And I called my sister up and I just said, Spelly. And she was up in Byron and she'd already started making jewellery and selling it at the markets. And I just said, do you need a business partner? And she just said, 
oh my god, yes, I do. It's like it hadn't occurred to her, and all of a sudden, it just the pieces clicked together, and um, that's me up in Byron. About four weeks later, I packed up my apartment, and I was living up in Byron Bay with my sister, one half of a fashion label. And I will say for anyone in the audience who's a little bit concerned about my heart and what happened after that, um, I always say that if you're following your path and you start to get truly happy, miracles can happen. And I remember the first week I was in Byron Bay, um, I had a meeting with a friend who had worked in Sydney in magazines or something and I wanted to pick her brain. And at the end of the meeting I sort of said, so are there any single guys in town that you can suggest? <laughs> and she looked at me and she just said, Johnny Abeg, and that's my husband now and the father of my two children. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that story ended really well. Um, so, anyway, I was up in Byron Bay, uh, loving my new world that I was in, uh, making jewellery and going to the markets. We weren't making any money. Like Spelly said in the video, we were pretty much just making money and selling stuff, and we both had second jobs, and she was working at a cafe. I was working at a cafe, and she was at a hostel. And... When I'd moved up, Isabella had just opened her arms and let me into the business for nothing. I had no money and she just opened her arms. There was no buying or anything like that. So I felt this huge responsibility on my shoulders to turn it into a viable business option for both of us. Um, I needn't have worried. Within about four years, the brand would turn over its first million dollar month and a couple of years after that, its first two million dollar month. So, that begs the question, how did we build the brand? Um, this is our first website. Uh, when I moved up in 2009, Isabella had asked a local HTML designer to design a website for us. Um, and without even asking, the, the HTML designer added a little e-commerce platform on it and it was super clunky and ugly and every time we wanted to upload even one picture of a necklace, we had to go through her and it was very awkward. But because I had had 15 years of experience in Photoshop and on computers, as soon as I got there, I was like, okay, I can do this. And I did redesigned the website and got it going. And I remember the first day we got the first online order. And I woke up in the morning and there was an order in my inbox for like a $45 pair of earrings. And I was just like, I was sleeping. And we just got an order. <laughs> and then I was like looking over here going, okay, so that's setting up the market, schlepping the tent putting up our lace and mannequins and the, then it would rain and you'd have to have your, like your iPhone out with your app up it in case you saw a storm approaching because you'd have to put all your jewellery away so it wouldn't get rained on and we did get rained on once we didn't see a storm approach and the whole tent collapsed full of rain and I was or sleeping while orders come through and it was kind of like this and it was pretty easy to kind of go, okay, let's just focus on this. But of course I had no idea about e-commerce or SEO or digital marketing. I didn't even know it existed, so I didn't even know that I should be learning about it. And um, the only way that I could think of driving people to our, our little website was through our blog. So we started to create content and share it online. Now, <laughs> there was this huge knowledge gap in you know, running an e-commerce store and not knowing anything about it was... There was so much naivety there and inexperience, but it was this naivety and inexperience that, l that pushed us to use the imagery that we were creating as our only way of pushing people to our website. And today, that's still our largest, most influential marketing tool that we use. And I'm really grateful for the fact that I didn't just go to the obvious and the conventional, which was digital marketing. I will say, though, that we do use digital marketing. I've got a few stats to show you later. It's huge. And it... I can only think what the brand would be today if we were able to employ all of those ideas back then. But anyway, so blogging was huge for me. Um, I'd spent my entire life sharing stories through visuals. So when I got up to Byron, it was like I had this whole new world around me and I just wanted to share that story. And so I just took to blogging like a duck to water. And it reminded me of um, scrapbooking when I was little. I'd done a lot of scrapbooking. Me and my sisters would, you know, draw pictures and create beautiful montages and then of course you'd close the scrapbook and put it on the on the shelf and no one would see the images but with blogging you were showing it to the world and so we started to create these beautiful shoots and the more beautiful the, the shoots were the more people were flocking to our blog um I'd, I'd i'd been editing a lot of corporate videos and television commercials all my life so i didn't want the shoots to feel advertising or like pushing too much product so we'd mix a lot of our clothes with 
vintage clothes and my huge vintage collection. And we just wanted it to be like a reflection of our lives and a reflection of the lifestyle that we dreamed of. So blogging was like this really tight community. And I guess it's not too different to, it, to, to what it is today, but it was really... Social media hadn't exploded yet. Instagram wasn't around. Pinterest hadn't even launched. And blogging, people were still finding each other on all these blogs. And it was this community that I saw that if you interacted with each other, even more uh, stronger develop relationships developed. So the more I interacted with our followers, the stronger the relationships developed. And all of a sudden, orders started coming in from all over the world. We were communicating with bloggers all around the world, people like Amanda Shadforth from Oracle Fox and Jessica Stein from Tool of Vintage, and some of these ladies would become some of Australia's biggest fashion bloggers. Uh, a lot of these bloggers now charge thousands of dollars to do an outfit post, but still post for, spell with post for spell for free because of the relationships that were developed in those early years. Just some more imagery from some of our campaigns. Um, uh, US... Uh, Retail giants Free People found us on blogs and a lot of our, our wholesalers overseas and that really started to open up a market over in America and that just started to tip the scales a little bit and again, we just started, the online presence was just growing more and more and more. I still remember, I think Nicole mentioned it before, I still remember when I jumped online and saw Sienna Miller wearing one of our t-shirts and that might not mean anything to you guys but at the time she was our style icon so it was very exciting to see that the story was reaching out beyond Byron Bay and beyond our own tight little community. It was very exciting. And then this little app called Instagram launched. Uh, within a week or so of it launching I jumped on, it must have come up in the app store or something, whatever it was. But I was swearing to everybody around me that it was going to be the next big thing. I was so excited and I was like, get on this, get on this, and trying to get all my friends on it. And obviously it was. And as soon as Instagram launched, um, uh, as soon as Instagram launched, it was like every small brand, large or small, had a voice. And it was kind of this even playing field. And I remember some of the big brands that I really looked up to, it was a couple of years before they jumped on Instagram. So people often ask us, how do we get this really big, strong following on Instagram? It really was just being an early adopter, probably nothing more <laughs> than that, and the relationships we developed, because everyone at the beginning was so excited. Oh, yeah, Nicole's trying to tell me to tell, me to tell a story. I was, she was up with me and Byron one day, and we were having a chai at one of the cafes, and I was trying to tell her about Instagram, and she's like, oh, whatever. And I, I said, okay, watch this. And I took a photo of my boots that we sold online and I posted it to Instagram and then I just showed her as the orders started to come through. I was like, look. And by the time we'd finished our chai, I think we'd sold like three pairs of shoes. So that's our Instagram now. But um, yeah, it's still obviously one of the, well, it is the biggest driver of traffic to our website now. And we certainly couldn't live without it. Pinterest is number two, by the way. And then everything just went social. Of course, there are many other reasons uh, why we experienced some positive, um, all that positive growth over those years. We had a great team and an amazing, passionate customer base. And then there was the fact that the brand was really authentic. Oh, just quickly, that's the digital marketing um, stats that now that I learned, I basically took on an e-commerce manager two years ago, maybe two and a half years ago, and she was like, yeah, digital marketing is a big thing. And you can see the return on investment there is just absolutely phenomenal. And I was like, right, so SEO, Google AdWords, cool. So it's, yeah, it's, it really has made a huge impact on our business. Like, so yeah, it's not just blogging and Instagram. So yeah, as I said, the, bra the brand was authentic. Basically, Isabella and I had been carrying all these things around with us that we loved. And finally, we had this brand to put it into. It was our childhood. It was everything we'd grown up with. A lot of it came from our parents, or more specifically my dad, um, who was obsessed with America. And I think that's one of the reasons why our customers related to it, because they could see that it was just us. And we were just telling our story, and we were having so much fun while we were doing it. Uh, family's always been a really big part of our brand. Uh, Obviously, when Spelly and I came together, she was the creative, I was the entrepreneur, and that really fused. Um, but also my sister, uh, her, Isabella's twin sister, is a makeup artist, and she works on all of our shoots. And my husband's a photographer and a filmmaker, so he's on all of our shoots as well and creating all of the film content that you see. 
I think family is a huge strength in any business because when I think family comes from the heart and when things come from the heart, it's authentic. Um, I'll just play this little video just because it is an illustration of um, just one of the uh, times we've tried to explain uh, where the designs have come from and they've always come from Spelly and I, so um, this video just explains that pretty well. The inspiration for Flower Child came from looking at old photographs. Oh my god, look how cute they are. Once Isabella had decided to reference these beautiful childhood florals, we started looking for vintage florals. One of Lizzie's dearest friends sent us this amazing vintage dress and we changed it up into beautiful sunflower retro colours and turquoises and pretty soft peachy pink. This is one of my favourite little tops. <laughs> Beautiful sharing tops, which came from this image here. Me wearing a <laughs> cute little dress. 1976, Lizzie's birthday. And then I got Aquarius somewhere. <laughs> all the motifs that we've created are all souvenirs from Spelly and Lizzie's childhood. It was really nice for Flower Child that Spelly really went back to our roots, into our childhood. So that takes us to um, the next part of our journey. Um, obviously over the last eight or nine years, our business has really matured. And it, felt, it feels like now there's not as much space to pioneer new things in that social media or online retail space. So when we started our business, yeah, so basically this takes me to the sustainability journey that we're on now. Uh, when we started our business, we built our relationships with our offshore suppliers based on gut feeling. Spelly and I would go there, we'd meet the owners. If the owners seemed to have integrity and share our values, and if the workers looked happy, we were happy. And then in 2016, I watched Fashion Revolution play out. Has anybody heard of Fashion Revolution in the month of April? A few people? Yeah. Um, so Fashion Revolution is an international advocacy group that was started to bring awareness around the ethical treatment of garment workers. Uh, after a factory collapsed in Bangladesh in 2013, killing thousands of factory workers there. So now every month during the month of April, every year during the month of April, they encourage consumers to ask brands who makes my clothes. And they encourage brands to also share those stories. So I watched this play out, I think it was 2016, and something just switched inside me. I just watched it and I watched little questions pop up on social media and one of our our customers emailed me and was very nice and just said, fashion revolution, who makes my clothes? And something just, I could just feel it. And I was pretty sure that our factories were ethical because my team and I had spent so much time there. We had good relationships with the workers and the owners. We had a really strict code of conduct that all of our um, suppl uh, suppliers signed and abided by. And like so many bands, we'd, brands, we'd always felt like that was enough. But as we matured, we realised that that wasn't enough. Our word wasn't enough and our factory's word wasn't enough. Our customers deserved transparency. In fact, I had this feeling they were going to start demanding transparency. And then I started to research ethics and sustainability in fashion. And oh, there we go, it's a new journey. And you kind of go down this rabbit hole. And I'll tell you right now, it's a really fucking dark hole. And it's <laughs> you end up feeling quite helpless. I was watching uh, documentaries and reading blogs and listening to podcasts and I watched Sist uh, True Cost, uh, the documentary, and I cried. Um, I felt hopeless and helpless and it felt like even if you had the most ethical factory in the whole world, there was still all the ecological um, issues around sustainability. It felt like even if we made a change to our business, all of those multinational fast fashion conglomerates were going to still be tearing our planet apart. But then that feeling I got during Fashion Revolution came back to me. I'd felt mobilised and excited about change. And I figured if I was starting to feel that way, then maybe other people were too. And I figured if a little label like ours started to play, make, play, make a difference and try and drive change, then other little labels might start as well and we might be able to drive change anyway. I felt like the fashion landscape was about to change. I could feel it, just like I felt it when I looked at Instagram for the very first time and went, this is going to be big. That's what I felt like about sustainability, meeting up with fashion. And over the past two years, we've seen it start. 
you've seen brands like Reformation and Ellen Fisher, obviously Patagonia, and a whole bunch of others start to really change this landscape into a place where it's super cool to be kind. When our brand was born, we infused it with inspiration and passion and our families and our hearts, but we didn't infuse it with sustainability. And I decided there, halfway down this very dark rabbit hole, that I wanted sustainability to be part of the DNA of our brand. I was determined to become part of the solution. And that's exactly what we've spent the last two years doing. At first, I had absolutely no idea how to tackle this. I felt like that very first person starting a business again, completely in the dark. Um, I remember literally sitting down at my computer and Googling, how do I become a sustainable brand? Or how do I get my factories accredited? And I was literally calling up the Ethical Trading Commission in the UK in the middle of the night, because obviously the time difference, to ask them to help me. They're like, who are you from Australia? What? And I was approaching random sustainability consultants to come and speak to my, um, to my team. And it was at this point that I really, really realised that we were at the very beginning of a long and continuous journey. Regardless, I knew we needed to start somewhere. And I figured the first step was to get every single one of our 14 suppliers ethically accredited. But even um, navigating the numerous ethical standards like RAP and ZX and BSCI and GOTS and all of those different ones was starting to get so confusing. It's been a huge last, uh, huge last couple of years and our, every single department of our team have had to mobilise to really make a difference in this area for us. We've spent the last 18 months completing stage one of mapping our supply chain and today we are very close to having every single one of our factory, factories ethically audited and a number of our factories have a range of environmental accreditations too which is really exciting. We launched our People and Planet page on our website. Um, We've been starting to tell the stories of the behind the scene moments where our clothes are made. In the vein of content creation, we've started to um, take films and visit the factories and shoot the workers there and the conditions there. Um, this was something that was really, really awkward and felt very uncomfortable to start talking about with our, on our social media and with our customers. Um, there's nothing less fashion than starting to talk about a factory. And at first we were really scared. There was a so much fear around it actually. Um, I felt like if we started talking about it, all of a sudden we'd open this can of worms and our customers might go, actually, yeah, who does make your clothes? And what's happening there? And what's this? And da da da. And that fear was really unfounded, actually. Once we started to talk about it, we could see that our customers just wanted more story. They're like, more story? Awesome. And we were so encouraged because, yeah, all the, we felt like they didn't want perfection from us. All they wanted was honesty and transparency. And that's why we felt even more buoyed to really just keep telling those stories. We've started to work with community-led artisan groups and fair trade organisations so that we can start to give back to the people who make, the, the communities that make our clothes. Uh, recently we visited one of their very far northwest communities, um, a super remote community. We had to get actually um, permits to even get into the town uh, in India uh, and we took a local guy and got him to film it. So we've really been having fun starting to tell stories and get our consumers to come along on this journey with us. I thought I'd share, just, it's a very short one, I'll, I'll share it today. Anna and I travelled over 500 kilometres from Jaipur to a remote artisan community close to Barmet in Rajasthan. We wanted to meet the women who were embroidering our sailor to kaftans. Because of the remoteness of this community, the techniques of the artisans and their craftsmanship has been preserved and really shielded from the influences of Western technology. It was amazing to see these women working on spell. We couldn't believe how long it took to embroider each kaftan. And now nobody wants to wait. Nobody wants to understand <laughs> hand embroidery. Like why? So if I tell them this one sample would take five days, and they'll be like, oh, can you do it on the machine? The whole concept gets killed because they don't want to wait. So many of these traditional techniques are being lost because of the speed of the fashion industry. These kaftans are helping us to celebrate the slowness of artisan craftsmanship. So where to next? Uh, in June we developed a 2025 sustainability vision with a number of strategies and ambitious targets that includes every facet of our business and supply chain from social advocacy, like that, environmental footprints and sustainable fibres. Basically, 
if the last eight years was about growing our business, I want the next eight years to be about carrying out this sustainability vision. I look at so many brands around me like Patagonia, the godfather of sustainability practices in fashion, a true pioneer. And then more recently brands who were able to start from a place of sustainability like Reformation and Elaine Fisher, who do an incredible job, by the way, and we look up to a lot. Um, these brands have been pioneering a, a new way for fashion and have literally woven sustainability into the, brand, into the brand and into their marketing. In fact, if you jump on the Everlane Instagram or the Reformation Instagram, there won't be a day that they're not telling their sustainability story in their social media. And I guess I've been looking at those brands that inspire us and I'm hoping that one day, if we continue along this journey, we're able to inspire brands that come up behind us. Um, hopefully, one day we'll uh, inspire a fellow grassroots bootstrap business to join the journey too, or perhaps, if we reach them early enough, allow their founder story to start from a place of sustainability instead. And that's it. Thank you so much. Look, yeah, it's um, so um, when you're starting out in the fashion industry, how do you start from this place of sustainability? And look, um, that's one of the biggest things that I've been thinking about at the moment because if I had a do-over, if I was able to go back eight, nine years ago and start again, I know that we would not have been able to start our business from a pla place of sustainability. We just did not have the resources. And now where we are now, I feel so privileged to be in this position where we're financially um, mobile and able to put resources into, basically we're getting a lot of help from sustainability experts, uh, third party freelancers who are coming in and working with our team and that's what they do for a living. Um, one of the things I'm thinking about doing at the moment is creating a resource uh, for brands who don't have those resources. Um, Things like, I mean, I've, I'd never heard of SEDEX, GOT, RAP, BSCI and all of those things. And if you go on those, those websites, they often have suppliers on them. But until you know what those accreditations are, it's hard to even find those. Um, there are uh, trade shows where you can go and we have found some of our sustainable suppliers through trade shows. So we've walked, um, uh, maybe I'll put it up on the blog, the details of when those trade shows are. Um, but you can often walk the floor and speak to them and and see their, they'll actually have the certificates with them. Um, but it is something I'm thinking about at the moment because it, it's really, it's something that we're investing heavily in now and I know that in the early days it's really hard to do that. You're literally trying to make every, you know, you're living day to day and it's really hard to invest in those, those things. But I think that eight years ago that information probably wasn't as readily available and I think today it's, it is a lot more available. So yeah, we're going to hopefully build a bit of a resource there for people like you. <laughs> I think when I was in such a dark place after the breakup for that year. Um, I guess one of the things I used to say at the end of my talk was list, um, those places when you're in a place of darkness or lost or they're often the times when if you really listen, the voices inside speak actually the loudest and that's what it felt like. It felt like it was so bad that when I closed my eyes and I did that course and I came out the other edge, it actually wasn't confusing anymore. It was just bright as day and I went up and obviously like you say my sister just happened I don't think I would have started on my own she was the creative she's the designer and I was able to go up and help her so that was kind of very fortuitous but um, I will say that it wasn't the turquoise we don't really even design turquoise anymore it wasn't it wasn't the jewelry or the turquoise it was the entrepreneur it was the entrepreneurial world that was this I'd been looking for creativity I'd been doing artist nights and African dancing and um, I'd done the artist way and I was trying I thought it was creativity and artisticness that I was searching for but it wasn't it was it was business and that's what excites me now is I don't really look on jewelry websites I look on business websites I read the collective and I'm that to me that's what excites me so I think any business I had have started I probably would have found that same passion does that kind of help Maybe, not really, I don't know. It did feel, yeah. It's always, I always say it's so dark between the worlds. Between that point and that point, there's always so much darkness and wind, for sure. There's so many. Um, like I said, we've started this in stages, and the first stage was to make sure that everything was, a, a, uh, was ethical from the people point of view, that we wanted everyone to know that if you go into a factory, the, tr the workers are all treated well. They've all, it's all the different points there are being ticked. Um, and then at that point, we've almost 
then just being able to get onto the sustainability stuff and that's where we are now. Um, B Corp is something we've looked into. Um, I think because all of our offshore, all of our productions offshore at the moment, like we could make our on, like all of our Australian headquarters and everything would be really pretty easy to, to go through a B Corp um, accreditation. But our 14 suppliers in Peru and India and China, I think it's a lot, it's, it <laughs> it's a bit of a bigger picture than that. Um, we're really lucky to have an incredible sustainability consultant that's working with us. And at the moment, we're looking at our fibres. That's probably the next big step, especially because a lot of our garments are made of rayon. And rayon is not amazing in any way. So it's really something we're looking... It, you know, it, it's a big part of our collections are rayon. Uh, and, we've, we're, you know, we've already uh, designed a kids' collection that's fully sustainable because it's a new collection, so we're able to just start from fresh. Um, our swimwear collections, we've moved completely for the next collection, will be all made out of recycled rayon, uh, nylon. So that's amazing. But our, our rayon stuff, which is a huge part of our collections, is, is, is a, big, a big step, and we're literally working in lots of different areas to try and work on that. Um, so you've asked, um, how would one that has all those ideas um, flowing through them step out of maybe a day job into the entrepreneurial world? Yes. <laughs> um, look, I mean, I think that I, when I started Spell, I thought an entrepreneur was a man in a suit walking down like the CBD of Sydney or Melbourne with a briefcase. That's what I thought an entrepreneur was. And I think that the idea around an entrepreneur over the last, uh, you know, half decade is, has, has so greatly shifted. So, I mean, I think with, <laughs> look, there's always that, do I leave my day job and take a plunge and leap and the net will appear? Or do I, you know... And I think that um, so many people in our office and we have an incredible team with so much talent, I don't think there's even one of them that don't have a side project. They are, they are hustling on the side and I think that there's... I had to make a move all the way to Byron, but I don't think that's necessary. I think that, you know, you, I didn't have Instagram in my pocket at the time, but now you do. And I don't see why, if you've got a job providing it's not sucking the living daylight out of you, um, hopefully you'd be able to have a side hustle that, you know, you just grow and grow and grow and then you know when to leap and trust that that net will appear. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm in the podcast world at the moment. Oh, my gosh. I'm just, like, loving it. Besides the Buffy. The, is anyone watching bu buff Buffering the Vampire Slayer? Is anyone into Buffy? Anyway. Um, okay, so you've asked if, if are there any um, conferences or um, resources that have blown my world in the entrepreneurial world. And that is, um, there's definitely a few podcasts that I'm loving at the moment. I don't know if you've read, if you've listened to uh, Reid Hoffman's Masters of Scale. Uh, he uh, is a big player in the IT space in America, in Silicon Valley, and he speaks to some of the most amazing um, IT startup people and these these are people obviously Mark Zuckerberg and the founder you know the, the founder of Netflix and uh, Airbnb and they're obviously huge people that you wouldn't think would relate to us to you but the nuggets of gold that they're able to give are incredible like there's a reason these people are geniuses so I'm loving that podcast um, he goes through and does uh, it's an eight series eight eight episode series but then he goes and does all these extras and I'm listening to all the extras. Um, I do love um, Tim Ferriss and all of his business more, I don't, not so much the, the, the fitness ones but the business ones and obviously Girl Boss I love, it's pretty good but yeah I'm just kind of, um, I find that once you get onto a really good podcast they're of often advertising similar podcasts. Um, in terms of um, conferences I've been lucky to speak at quite a few so I often get to attend them which is really great. There's a, um, a, biz a company called Run the World, uh, a women's entrepreneurial um, community and I find that they're an entrepreneurial co collective of, of people who are, it really is very, very heart um, and I've, I've probably found the most kinship there and it really feels like it's not about we're fucking awesome, it's like it's really from here and I really, I really love going to their events. Um, there really wasn't, um, it, it, so you, you asked me, um, along the journey, has there been some challenges, those breakthrough moments where you felt like, you yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I was just repeating the question. I totally understand your question. <laughs> um, so were there any challenges that made me feel like we were going to give up along the way? Um, that 
the journey of Spell has been like, it has been really smooth. There has been moments when the wheels have felt like, there was a whole other bit of the talk that I, Nicole came and met me in my hotel room last night and I took it out because it didn't feel relevant, but um, uh, where it really did feel like the wheels were about to fall off, we were experiencing a huge amount of growth and I'd always thought the growth was really, really great and how could it be bad, but it felt like this kind of billy cart going down a hill and the wheels were about to fall off. But when that was happening, I felt like we, ha we had the team and I was incredibly lucky to take on an office manager who actually applied for a warehouse position at the very beginning of our business and she's now our, the closest thing we have to a CEO. She's absolutely incredible and she has been able to help us navigate growth in a very humble way um, in that there was about two or three years there right in the middle of when we started to now where we decided not to grow at all anymore and we took on the mantra better not bigger and so with the... Um, every decision we made within the business, we asked, is this going to make our business better, not bigger? And we, um, we invested in infrastructure and people and systems and procedures and logistics. And when we came out of that period, we were just so much stronger. And that's where we feel like we've sort of ended up today, just really with this really strong, amazing culture in our business. So there's never been a time when we've, you know, we've both had two children in that time. And yeah, there, there was a time when, when anyone asked me, how's everything going, how are the kids, and I'd burst into tears. So probably juggling motherhood was the hardest, but it was never a question of giving up the business. It was just finding more help. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. All right. Thank you so much, guys. It's been so amazing chatting.